So right now, we're going to have Thor uh, learn us how to teach some cryptography, which I'm actually very, very curious about. Um, Thor has been working on a project which attempts to do this. And uh, I believe it's called Hashcloak, right? Or Uncloak, sorry. Uncloak is the, the OG. Uh, in which case, uh, I think he knows a little bit about this. So welcome, Tor. And I'm looking forward to Guillermo's later talk about how he reduces it all to linear algebra. So. <laughs> Yeah, so welcome, welcome. Um, so I'm Thor. For the last several months, I've been working on specifically a course teaching cryptography and zero-knowledge cryptography to an audience of developers who are sort of looking to do more in ZK development or understand cryptography at a sort of more general level. So in this talk, we're going to sort of take uh, a bit of a high level, but we're going to try to break down sort of the fundamentals of what uh, ZK primitives are built on, take a look at some of the definitions, try to make them approachable, um, and hopefully you'll leave this talk with a sort of better sense of how ZK is sort of constructed from a high level and maybe some learning approaches to thinking about zero knowledge as a sort of topic area. So I am Cryptographer on Twitter, and the project is Uncloak, and we've been running open courses through our Discord server and posting weekly to our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to find those communities, you can approach me after the talk. And uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, button. Button. Yeah, so who is this talk for? Uh, well, this talk for is basically for, I think, people who would like to develop ZK circuits, who would like to understand ZK circuit programming maybe a little bit better. Um, educators like myself, since I think there's a sort of large gap of sort of new paradigms to understand. So ZK is a fundamentally different sort of set of primitives than we're usually exposed to as programmers. And it's for the too embarrassed to ask. Um, and I want to really thank Guillermo for being both embarrassed and asking anyway. <laughs> um, so hopefully we'll be able to clear up some stuff. Uh, and it's for the guy at the party who thinks that ZK is pretty neat but doesn't know how to explain it to everyone else at the party. <laughs> so goal. You want to be the guy on the uh, left. Yeah, left. That's the one. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get you there. Um, now, for the starter example, like I think that you've probably all seen the starter examples in ZK before. But it's OK to kind of wander back through them and use them for context setting. So in this sort of like basic sort of example of like how we want to start thinking about zero knowledge when we're thinking about this, is we want to think about like the three definitions of zero knowledge, which are completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge, all of which are fairly well demonstrated by the colorblindness example. And so as I'm sure at least many of you are familiar, the colorblindness example is the prover, Bob, says that he sees color, and Alice says, no, there is no color. <laughs> there will be no color. Color does not exist, and I need you to prove this to me. So the prover says, yeah, I see color. So Alice says, OK, here are two balls that look exactly the same, precisely the same. And the prover says, OK, yeah, I, I think I see a difference. And so he says, no, you didn't switch them. And so they go, OK, prove it. And he says, no, you didn't switch them. She does it again. And they do this 80 more times. And every time Bob gets it correctly, of course, Alice says, hmm, well, if he was just guessing there was only a 50% chance, but if he does it, 80 times, then he has to get basically two to the negative 80 chance of being lying. So like obviously, we get a pretty good sort of sense that Bob is now a very, very good guesser or, or is probably correct that colors exist. And so Alice might be forced to say, OK, color might be real, grr. <laughs> um, and so to go back to these definitions, we have some sense that ZK is the uh, is the synthesis of these three properties. We have completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge. And so when we're thinking about the context of ZK circuits, um, we're also going to run into these three properties where we want to convince the verifier that I know some program and I've computed some program, just as Bob in this context has proven that color exists to Alice. And we are going to say, come to circuits with this same paradigm. So in the context of these definitions, just to sort of expand on them, 
ZK is the synthesis, or zero knowledge proofs are the synthesis of these three primitives, or these three uh, definitions. Completeness is that Alice is convinced by an honest prover that if Bob actually does see color, then Alice is convinced that color exists and that Bob can tell the difference. Um, Bob can't cheat uh, and still convince Alice. So soundness is that if Bob is lying about the existence of color, he can't obviously convince Alice, except with very small probability. And finally, the ZK property is that Alice doesn't really learn anything except the thing that Bob wants to reveal. Um, and the ZK property is sort of the hardest to explain the sort of technical definition of because it involves terms like a simulator, but the core of the idea is effectively that Alice learns nothing. And so this is sort of like a good example because all three of these properties are very clearly depicted. Um, with the Waldo example or the cave example, they can be a little bit harder, I think, to, to get out. Um, so next we're going to move to something slightly more mathematical. We're gonna to move to Schnorr's Sigma protocol for proof of knowledge of exponent. And in this example, I sort of want to demonstrate a more uh, actually applicable zero knowledge proof than I see color. Um, and we're going to say that Bob knows the exponent in, uh, in a discrete log. So, as before, Bob is going to claim to know something, this exponent x in the discrete log problem, and this is actually a fairly fundamental protocol that gets used in things like polynomial commitment schemes. In fact, we can take any sigma protocol and turn it into a convenient polynomial commitment scheme. Um, but if you don't know the word polynomial commitment scheme, that's okay. Um, the sort of core thing to focus on is that we can take this slightly more mathematically involved example and still understand the basic premise that zero knowledge, completeness, and soundness are preserved by this new protocol and then we can apply that to the context of circuits, which we'll do next. So in this context, Bob says, I know x in some public key, capital X equals g to the x, and Alice says, as before, nah. And so, next up, Bob says, well, I'm gonna have to think really hard about how to demonstrate that I know x, but he might come up with Schnorr's sigma protocol. If, you see, if you've seen uh, a Schnorr signature before, this will look actually fairly similar because the, the protocol is basically just Bob sends a Schnorr signature that proves that he knows the private key. But if you don't know Schnorr's signatures, it's really quite simple. Bob throws some randomness at Alice. Alice throws some randomness back. And then Bob takes the randomness and smashes it all together in the element Z, um, where Alice can't peel the secret key back out of, out of Z because the randomness that Bob chose lives behind a shield, and so it lives behind this commitment, where we generally think um, the discrete log is a fairly useful thing, because it lets us say, force Bob to select R without revealing what R is, and then get Alice's inputs back and say, okay, uh, well, Alice can verify that Bob is bound to this element, and Dallas can verify that z equals a plus x, or ax plus r, inside of the exponent, but, Bob, but Alice never gets the secret private key out. So I'll leave this on the screen for just a couple more seconds before I continue nattering. But the sort of core idea in this protocol is interactivity. And we actually use this core idea of interactivity in proofs, despite the fact that we don't actually use interactive proofs in practice. We use non-interactive proofs. And the sort of way we do this is that most interactive proofs look basically like this, where Alice chooses some random element, A. Um, and if, if we can say, if we want to enter the sort of paradigm in which non-interactive proofs are constructed from interactive proofs, Al the verifier uh, is basically just an abstraction that we use. In fact, we can say, if Bob can say, generate some randomness from a public source, say a hash function, where Bob gets to choose the initial seed, then we can sort of say, Alice is a convenient abstraction, but at the end of the day, Bob is just going to treat her as this source of randomness that we can then swap out with a hash function, or a random oracle in more cryptographic slang. So the, the sort of core idea here that I wanted to communicate is, is two things. First, that we have like this idea of interactive proofs that we can render into non-interactive proofs. 
by treating ls as just a source of randomness that we can then swap out with a hash function. And then second, that the, uh, the way that we use hidings in the, the exponent um, is sort of something that we can then expand upon in, in, in commitment schemes, which we'll get to a little bit in a little bit. So back to the definitions. Um, so when we talked about the definitions for the, the color protocol, we introduced these three terms that are the sort of core sense of what a zero-knowledge proof is. We have this sense of completeness that Alice is convinced by an honest prover, and if Bob does indeed know the exponent x, then he can indeed compute a x plus r, and so a convincing prover satisfies completeness in this context. That soundness is satisfied, that Bob can't cheat. Um, if Bob does not know x, then with only very small probability will he be able to convince Alice that these exponents are aligned because he'll just be guessing at values of x. And then finally, zk. Um, Alice would need to break discrete log to actually obtain information about the secret key x. And so these are, again, useful things to keep in mind when thinking about what we're actually trying to achieve when we're, th when we're, when we're writing these ZK circuits. And so it is now circuit time. And Boolean computation is the thing that we're all kind of used to working with when we think about, OK, I want to compute a program. Now, um, Boolean computation is not what cryptographers like. We like fields, uh, finite fields, to be quite precise. Um, we don't like infinite fields, and we certainly don't like <laughs> uh, floating point arithmetic. But we love, we love fields that we can do multiplication and addition over and never have to think about a Boolean operation like an OR or an AND gate. And conveniently for us, there is a way for us to pretend that, that George Bool never existed. I think his name is George. I could be wrong there. Um, that Boole never existed, and that, in fact, we can just treat everything as a, an addition and a multiplication operation, right? Um, so the way we sort of do that is that we say, OK, well, if we take, uh, if we take the bits, uh, b0 and b1, and we can just say, well, and is just the multiplication of these bitwise elements. That's convenient. And or is just the uh, addition of two bit elements minus their multiplication. So we get this very like, OK, yeah, they're, they're perfectly equivalent. And the answer to the question, can we translate Boolean, arith or Boolean logic to arithmetic, is yes. And the, the, the etch of Alan Turing here saying nice is a, is a gesture to the fact that with Boolean arithmetic, we get a Turing complete machine. But since we have arithmetic that is equivalent to our Boolean logic, we also have a Turing complete machine that we can do inside of just arithmetic over a finite field by doing this simple translation. Now, um, the next thing we might like to do, and this is sort of trying to gesture at the direction of what are we doing when we write a program. Um, and don't, don't take notes on this assembly, because I, I kind of scribbled it out and made it up. Um, but when we write our program in a high-level language, we need to say, let's do some memory op operations. Let's load some value from memory into a register. Let's do some operations over those registers, maybe bitwise operations, XORs, ORs, ANDs, NANDs, whatever. Um, maybe some addition or whatever. We're going to add registers to constant values or other registers. And the way that our high-level program is going to get translated is eventually going to be into some assembly-like instructions, right? And so in our previous example, like the goal was to sort of say, well, if we have um, these equivalents of addition and multiplication gates in, in OR and AND gates, well, then we can say, instead of translating these into Boolean logic, we can translate it into finite field arithmetic. And so now we're starting to see like, the direction that, that circuit arithmetic is getting us towards, is that instead of translating everything into ORs and ANDs, or more precisely from the hardware level, everything is in fact a NAND gate, um, but that's somewhat a tangent, we're going to translate it all into a, a circuit, a, an arithmetic circuit. But there's an issue. Um, and the issue is, 
that if we have, say, an eight register machine or some number of registers in the machine, um, for each register uh, or for each operation, there's going to be a new layer in our circuit. And for somewhat arcane reasons involving uh, polynomials and multilinear evaluations that we will not get into, we really want a short depth circuit. So if we have O of n instructions, we're going to get O of n layers in our circuit. And that's kind of a bummer, because this basically means that if our prover wants to prove something, they need to hand an O of n operation check to the verifier. So when we actually write our circuits for ZK DSLs, we usually are writing either, um, we, are, we are doing basically exactly this. We say, well, let's write our assembly. Um, if we're writing an assembly ZK circuit, like CIRCOM or Maiden assembly, or let's write a high-level program that gets compiled to some assembly, um, like uh, NOAR or, or risk zeros high-level machines, we're going to translate that to assembly, it's going to get translated to this not very, uh, this, this kind of long circuit. But we don't want long dogs, we want short dogs. So we have one trick left in our arsenal when we talk about how can we do everything succinctly, because this is what we're trying to get to when we're talking about zero knowledge proofs, is this premise of succinctness. And that trick in our arsenal is that we shove everything at the base layer. So if we have an honest prover, they are going to compute the intermediate values in our circuit. And in fact, we can shove a lot of those intermediate values just back onto the base level of our circuit. Um, and this means that instead of getting a long circuit, like the one that we would have originally programmed, the circuit that is O of n in length, where n is the number of operations, the number of assembly instructions, we can get a short guy and our short guy is going to be succinct to verify because it might be only O of log n, or depending on our transformation, even O of constant time, if we do this transformation moving everything onto the base layer. And what's sort of left here for us is that the things that were really simple for us to do were arithmetic operations like addition and multiplication. And I'm going to just briefly gesture at things that are not simple to do within the context of a circuit. The thing that is the least simple to do in the context of a circuit is memory accesses, because those are not arithmetic. They're not Boolean logic. And that's sort of where lookup tables enter in, if you've, if you've heard that term, like P lookup from, from Aztec. Where those sort of enter into the picture is that there are some operations that don't neatly translate into arithmetic operations like addition and multiplication. And so what we need to do there is we need to say, well, the prover needs to say, here is the ordered sequence of accesses in memory. When I store something into memory, it needs to be the same thing when I go load it later. And this actually could be an issue because the prover could lie about, well, if I stored something into memory and I got to the end of my circuit and I really need this to be a three, but in fact I cheated and this, this is 376, we need to bind the prover to the fact that this is in fact whatever it's supposed to be. So we use a Merkle tree and that's sort of where the uh, circuit arithmetic hash functions come in. We need to include in these witness values the Ws that have moved onto the base layer. We need to commit to a Merkle tree inside of our, our new circuit down here. Um, and this can be the source of like some additional height, right? Because our Merkle tree is going to be logarithmic in the total number of witnesses that we need to put in. And so our new circuit will be perhaps logarithmic in the new number of witnesses but not linear in the total number of operations that we need to calculate. So this is a pretty significant improvement when we think about what our ZK circuit should actually be able to accomplish. But what we win is succinctness. Um, and this sort of transformation here is basically that we can change our writing a circuit C of X equals Y where x values were these things on the left. We get c of x equals y, where y is some claimed output of the circuit on some unknown inputs x. And we can transform the circuit into a circuit satisfiability instance, where circuit satisfiability means in this context, the prover had claimed to have some value x satisfying c of x equals y. Um, circuit satisfiability is a sort of different kind of circuit where we just need to say, does there exist a vector w 
such that this new circuit, which I might have been polite and labeled C prime for this convenience, um, does this new circuit that we use a transformation for have a satisfying additional vector, w, such that the same thing is true after we perform our compilation step from c of x into c of x w. Um, and so that's where we, we sort of do our transformation into R1CS or do Planck-ish arithmetization schemes where we need to satisfy this circuit satisfiability instance. And then we can compute the values for x and w, which is simply computing the original circuit C of x equals y. That gives us our values for w, because our w's are inter our intermediate values, plus some extra overhead for the uh, IO operations that I mentioned. And then finally, when we compute our proof pi, our proof pi is this sort of complicated step that I, I, I'm sort of alluding in this context, because that would be another 30-minute talk. But I will briefly gesture at it. The way we actually prove anything in the context of our circuit is that we need to say, well, the verifier is going to know y. Um, but they aren't necessarily going to know the inputs x1 through, through xn. And we can do this operation row by row over the layers of our circuits in what, what, is, popular, what is called the GKR protocol. We can take the GKR protocol and say, like, do this layer by layer evaluation of our circuits relating the outputs at each layer to the outputs at the previous layer. And at the final layer, we need to have the, the, the verifier know something about the actual inputs. And that is where polynomial commitment schemes come in. So come back to my next talk, and we'll talk about the GKR protocol and polynomial commitment schemes. Um, and then finally, we have the prover compute the proof pi, attesting to the knowledge of x and w satisfying this expression. Um, and to go back to definitions, we have this model of completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge. Well, the prover would never be able to convince a sat uh, or the, if, the, if the prover actually does this transformation, they will always know the intermediate values of the original circuit, the Ws, will always be able to compute the transformation, will always be able to prove to the verifier that their circuit is satisfied. Uh, for soundness, a cheating prover would need to say, that circuit is too hard for me, I'm just going to come up with a bunch of W values, um, and the circuit satisfiability instance will be difficult for the cheating prover to abuse. And then finally, for zero knowledge, if the verifier is attempting to learn the values of the Ws, um, the verifier would have to completely determine all of the values of the Xs and reevaluate the circuit to obtain these. So um, we get completeness, succinctness, and zero knowledge for this circuit. And that's pretty much it. So thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. And if cool, cool. We have about five minutes for questions. If anyone has questions for Thor, I'll just dance while you think about your questions. <laughs> no, no, no one has any questions. No ideas. No notions. Constructions. Ah, there we go. All right, there's one. A brave soul, indeed. And we have a runner, so. Okay. So I have a bit of silly question. What exactly is W? Is the question? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, what is W? In what the is W? Ah, so yeah. the W stands for the witness. Um, so when we're talking about, looks like the slides are gone. Um, the W is what we refer to as the witness. In our original circuit, when we say C of X equals Y, um, the X values are usually the thing that we're trying to not have to send entirely to the verifier because they can be very long. Um, when we extend the circuit with this transformation from C of X equals Y to C of X W equals Y, the witness values are all of the intermediate values and potentially other things too. So if the circuit doesn't have a convenient way to, say, compute the inverse of some element, where we would have to do, say, the extended Euclidean algorithm to compute the witness inside the circuit, what we can do instead is we can, say, include some values in the witness that weren't necessarily intermediate values, but are what are called advice values. So there are a couple of things that go in the witness. First is things that were intermediate values in the original circuit. 
Second is things that are uh, advice values that are like maybe the inverse of some element where instead of saying do the entire circuit computation of the inverse, we just check that in that new element times the thing it's the inverse of is equal to one. So that's a fairly easy optimization that we can do with advice values. And then finally, we need to have, like I mentioned, the, the, the lookup table elements need to have um, some proof that they are, in fact, the, the valid transcript of elements of the I.O. operations. So those things all tend to live inside of the witness W. And if the prover has those things inside of his head, um, it, he has computed the original circuit and transformed it into this subsequent circuit where he has these new vectors of values that he can run through this new circuit that we create. And this new circuit will be low depth, so it will be efficient for the verifier to run their uh, operation. The, the verifier's time is linear in the number of layers that there are in the circuit. So we want those values to be all living at the flat bottom and have a short circuit. And that's kind of what we get for this transformation. Did that help? Yeah. And one more question. On one of the slides, you have like two circuits. And yeah, if you could show. <clears throat> Yeah, so this purple uh, un unlabeled, is this a sum or a multiplication or some other operation? Is what a sum or a multiplication? Yeah, yeah, yeah like you have these pur purple blocks that are not ah. labeled. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, I didn't put things in this box because I was lazy. But ultimately, <laughs> uh, I, did, I did put the equals zero at the top. So for uh -huh, a circuit okay. satisfiability, uh, gates, we're going to be saying, well, is the addition of, in this first left example, is the addition of x0 and x1 plus whatever we put in the witness 0 box, is that equal to 0? Mm -hmm. And if the outputs of everything is 0, then we have achieved our circuit satisfiability instance, where we are trying to find some inputs for w's that achieve this everything equals 0 argument. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool. We have one more minute. If anyone has any last questions. If not, well, thank you, Thor. Everyone give a round of applause.